Okay, so um, No Man is an Island, creativity and collaboration across time. So one of the, the most famous geniuses, creative geniuses in history is William Shakespeare. So I thought we'd start with Shakespeare. How does Shakespeare write his plays? Now, the eagle-eyed among you will spot that that is not, in fact, a photograph of Shakespeare. Um, that is a still, a picture from the film Shakespeare in Love, which some of you may have seen. Um, it was made just over 20 years ago. And this is a picture of William Shakespeare in this film trying to compose his play. You can see that this is a picture of Shakespeare on his own, thoughtful, you're trying to come up with his great works. The candle is there so that he can write into the night in the solitary hours of darkness. Now, this image of Shakespeare is based on earlier images, and it's actually remarkably similar to other images, such as this one from the 19th century. So again, you can see this solitary figure, someone who's you know on his own, hand on his head, thinking in his room, um, communing with the muses, with his great ideas. So what we see in these images, these, these images which of course very much post-date Shakespeare himself, what we see in these images is an idea of creativity, creative genius as something that happens when someone, usually a man, is on his own, ideally in a quiet room, able to think great thoughts without the distractions that other people bring. The film Shakespeare in Love, which perhaps some of you have seen, but doesn't matter if you have or not, that film Shakespeare in Love also very much privileges the importance of an idea of originality. So in the film, Shakespeare has writer's block. He can't get on at all with his new play. And the play that he is working on in the film is called Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter. He can't manage to write it, he can't get inspiration. But then his real life romantic encounters with Viola, including Shakespeare disguising himself at a ball and a famous and an important balcony scene, these real life experiences inspire him to create Romeo and Juliet. So he uses his own original experiences to create great art. And I think this image of Shakespeare very much privileges modern ideas about intelligence and creativity, ideas which are in fact quite foreign to many times and places. So if we take first of all the idea of originality, which I think is very much privileged in our culture, the idea of how important it is to be original. Now most authors across time would not consider for a moment making up their own plots, it would not cross their minds. Um, Romeo and Juliet was not, you will not be surprised to hear, it, had not, it did not start life as Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter. And Shakespeare did not disguise himself at a ball and then call up to someone in a balcony with whom he was in love. None of that, of course, really happened. Romeo and Juliet was based on a number of sources which other people had written, including, most importantly, the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet, which had been published in English by someone called Arthur Brooke in 1562, so over 30 years before Shakespeare wrote his Romeo and Juliet. And Brooke's tragical history of Romeo and Juliet was itself based on continental sources, on other texts written in other languages about this story. So Shakespeare did not make up this story. He certainly didn't draw on his own original idiosyncratic experiences to come up with it. That's not where his genius lies. His originality, if you like, lies in the way that he uses language, in his extraordinary ability to craft poetry, in the way that he can play with words and language. He's certainly a genius at doing those kinds of things, but it was completely normal in the 16th century and for thousands of years before and some time after, it was completely normal to lift plots from other people and even to translate chunks from other people's texts or copy them pretty much verbatim without acknowledgement and that was not considered plagiarism but you know do not try this at home because it it is not <laughs> not okay today but in for, for a long time in literary history that was not considered problematic 
you know, some people have said there are only a handful of plots in the world that are essentially reworked by all authors. That's not where we should look for creativity, for genius. So in Shakespeare's time, no one expected him to make up his own plots. And indeed, there was no such thing as copyright. And that's really important when we think about these ideas of originality. Because today, of course, writers' own intellectual property is very carefully protected. That has not always been the case. So copyright was invented in the 18th century. And what, I've, what, I, what you can see here, I hope, is on the right, the, the transcription of the law. But on the left, I just thought I would give you a, a kind of little image of the law itself. So handwritten in the very early 18th century. So Queen Anne's law, um, which is our first law of copyright. It's not only Britain's first law of copyright, but the first law of copyright in the world. So this, this, this statute, the world's first copyright statute, from 1710 says, you can see the translation or the transcription on the right, whereas printers, booksellers, and other persons have of late frequently taken the liberty of printing, reprinting, and publishing, or causing to be printed, reprinted, and published books and other writings without the consent of the authors or proprietors of such books and writings, to their very great detriment, and too often to the ruin of them and their families. And then it goes on to make further provisions to prevent this from happening. So you can see in that very short excerpt that this statute is now getting across the idea that some ideas and texts belong to people, that, that, that they are, you can be the author or proprietor of such book. And of course, we would usually think of a proprietor as someone who owns property or a business, the proprietor of a pub or a restaurant, perhaps. So the idea that you can be the proprietor of your book, of your ideas, really does set up this idea of intellectual property, that you can own your ideas. And it's quite interesting to think about why this, this new idea about ownership becomes important at this time. You know, why does this happen? I mean, writing had become far more commercial after the invention of printing. So printing was invented in Europe, came, came to Europe in the late 15th century. Caxton set up a press in Westminster in the, late, in the late 15th century. And after that point, writing becomes something that is much more of a money-making enterprise, much more commercial. So before that, some people would simply write um, and wouldn't, not many people would read it. Some people would, might write for a patron who might ask for things that they liked. But once you get printing, you then have printers trying to think about what will sell. And so you get a kind of narrowing, actually, of the kinds of texts that are circulated because printers see what kinds of things sell and, they, and then they want more of those. They don't want um, chancy things. But writing becomes much more bound up with with an idea of making money. And the idea of named authors becomes more and more important. You know, will this author sell text? You know, as we still see very much today that a certain author's name, whatever they've written, will sell a text. And so once you start seeing that authors and texts can make more money, those authors and more especially the booksellers, the printers, the booksellers, they wanted to protect that ability to make money. And to establish the idea of a property right, that this really, that this text really does belong to someone, those booksellers and authors had to establish an idea of originality. What makes this, what makes this text belong to this person? How is it different from someone else's text? And so increasingly, people started to focus on ideas of originality, praising, praising authors as different as doing something new, which hadn't particularly been something that that critics, that commentators were interested in at earlier times. In 1770, for example, Samuel Johnson said that the highest praise of genius is original invention. So from the 18th century onwards, we really get this increasing focus on the idea that you can own your text and that it is original. Now, the other aspect of the Shakespeare picture that I was talking about, and I'll just uh, flick back to those if I can. So 
the other aspect of these pictures that I was talking about was the importance of isolation. That what we see in these pictures, this one's probably nicer, what we see in these pictures is someone on their own. And that is very characteristically what you see in author pictures. You know, when you've studied texts, I'm sure you've often had seen pic pictures, you know, maybe Penguin Classics or whatever, those kind of editions of text, and the frontispiece will be an image of the author, and the author tends to be alone. So this idea that a poet such as Shakespeare wrote on his own is really misleading. And again, it, it privileges a certain idea of creativity that we that we have to be apart from other people, that other people distract us when we are trying to focus on our intelligence, on, the, on our greatest thoughts. But in fact, Shakespeare was very much a collaborator. He worked with other people all the time. If you think about the nature of the theatre, that becomes in some ways obvious. I mean, theatrical invention is not something that can be done very effectively on your own. And that's particularly true of the early modern theatre, where plays were put on very quickly, often in a real rush. You'd have to write something very, very fast. There'd be lots and lots of different people involved. And those people would include the theatre managers, the people who were paying for it, the backers, the actors, and often a number of writers. So someone such as Shakespeare, who would be in the theatre, handing out parts to different people, and often the actors wouldn't each get the whole script, they'd get their parts, and then you'd have to kind of remember your cues, but you wouldn't actually see the whole play. And sometimes different people would be writing different bits of the play. The playwright would be doing very little sitting alone and thinking. A lot would be done on the run. In rehearsals, they might add bits in and change bits. There are different versions. So sometimes a version might be written down after the play, changed by the things that the actors had ad-libbed had ad -libbed or said at the time. Shakespeare also often wrote actually with other playwrights. And this is an idea of Shakespeare that has changed completely really over the last two or three decades. When I first studied Shakespeare, which is, I suppose, about 25 years ago. So when I was stud first studied Shakespeare, the narrative of Shakespeare in all the critical books, all the editions, was that Shakespeare wrote his plays on his own. That right at the end of his life, there were a couple of plays, Henry VIII and the two noble kinsmen, which were co-written with someone else. But your lecturers didn't really talk about that very much and that wasn't really seen as very important. The vast majority of this output was seen as absolutely single authored and that was not something that was discussed. It wasn't up for debate. It was, it was absolutely taken as fact that he wrote these plays on his own and that he wrote differently and most people would say at that time better than his um, contemporaries. But now, critical thought about that has completely changed. So the new Oxford Shakespeare, so an edition of the Complete Works of Shakespeare published four years ago, identifies 15 of his plays as having named co-authors. So there may well have been co-authors for other plays as well. But in those 15 plays, the editors have identified specifically who was working with Shakespeare on different parts of the plays and have often managed to extrapolate certain passages that were written by Shakespeare and other bits that were written by others. So these co-authors include playwrights such as Marlowe, Nash, Peel, Hayward, Middleton, Fletcher, some of whom are really quite obscure and little known to us today who were writing alongside Shakespeare. And these words that for hundreds of years, people have said, oh, no one could have written this except Shakespeare. His genius is unparalleled. He was completely different from all our other authors. Shakespeare didn't write a lot of those words. They were written by these co-authors, by people such as Nash or Peel, who many, many people today will not have heard of. And as well as these co-authors with whom he was going back and forth, they were sharing things, they were, you do that, but you do this, but oh, that's a good idea, should we do it like this? You know, we can imagine them working in that kind of collaborative way. But as well as those authors, there are many other people who we might think of as having something to do with the construction of Shakespeare's plays. So for example, I've already mentioned sources, the, one of the sources of Romeo and Juliet, that Shakespeare was in a, in a 
kind of collaboration with written texts as well as with the, the, the living authors with whom he co-wrote. There were also the, the written texts, all the sources that he used, which were manifold, you know, many, many different texts, many chronicles, many previous plays that Shakespeare is taking bits from, is working with. And he's also working with actors who would themselves change bits. They wouldn't necessarily reproduce or remember exactly what Shakespeare had or his collaborators had written. They might they might add different bits. They might add lib. Some of those bits might be terrible, but some might be good. He might want to keep them in. And then he doesn't have complete control over what ends up being printed either. You know, printers might change bits. They might um, the people, the kind of editors in charge of the actual production of the books could change things, could see things differently. So someone like Shakespeare really did not do it on his own. And that does not take away from the brilliance of, of that of that particular author, but it reminds us that there are many other people who were part of the writing process, that his brilliance was not achieved in isolation from the extremely dynamic, exciting, vibrant world of the stage and of books that, that surrounded him. So this idea that I've been talking about, that someone like Shakespeare had to write on their own and had to write with originality, is something that very much comes about from the 18th century and then starts to hold great sway for, for hundreds of years. But I want now to go further into the past and to talk a bit about different ideas of creativity. So different ways of thinking about creativity across time to try to get across a sense of some of the varied ways that we might think about how we write, how we think, and the way that great ideas, great texts can be formed in dialogue with others, not by the solitary individual in their ivory tower trying to think great thoughts that are dissociated from other people. So I'm going to take you right back to the earliest English poetry now. And don't worry about the fact that I've quoted here in in a language which will look completely unfamiliar to, I imagine, all or certainly most of you. Um, I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Because what I want to talk about now in this little section, unlocking the word hoard, is traditional poetry. So how people used to think about poetry. And a lot of what I'm saying is relevant to classical ideas of poetry, as well as to old English ideas of poetry. So the earliest poems that were written in these islands. Um, in Greek poetry, for example, quite a lot of, of ancient Greek poetry was made up orally. So the first versions of these of the, the great epic classical poems from Greek times were not written down by someone, but were made up by oral poets, by oral bards who would be putting the poems together as they spoke. And those poems might then be changed each time that they were spoken. So this isn't necessarily about memorizing a poem, but about having a general outline of a plot, which you could get from anywhere, as I've been saying, you know, people didn't think these plots had to be original. And then you would put together different phrases, different ways of telling the story that would change at different times. And those phrases, many of those phrases would not be your own phrases. And this is what I mean by unlocking the word hoard. So I'm going to talk specifically now about Old English poetry. So the earliest poetry written in English started to be made up and written down around the 7th, 8th centuries. And it was written in Old English, um, which will look to you fairly foreign. So I've, I've given you three quotations there. And although quite a lot of Old English words are familiar once you kind of drill down into them. It certainly initially looks very strange to you, I, I know. So please don't worry about that. I'm going to translate it all, of course, um, because the language changed, of course, radically after the Norman Conquest when French came into, into the language. So in Old English poetry, again, some of the poems were made up orally, so were made up in mead halls when people would sit around and ask for a poem and someone might tell a story wasn't one that they'd memorized word for word, but they'd have the outline of the story. And then they would put together 
a certain amount of pre-existing poetic phrases and they would connect them in different ways, but they would have this set of phrases and poetic formulae that they could use to to tell this story. And when poems were written down, or even if poems were written down without a prior oral um, version, when poems were written down, again, they would often utilize, in fact, they would pretty much always utilize certain set formulae. Now today, people often use the word formulaic to criticize texts. You know, so people will say, oh, that genre fiction is so formulaic romance it's so formulaic you know this has to happen by page 12 this has to happen by page 40 it's all done according to a kind of almost as if it's done according to a computer algorithm of you know, this happens then this happens then and people often talk about something being formulaic in order to dismiss it that's not how people thought about formulaic poetry in earlier eras so in the old english era poets storytellers would, would think of themselves as having shared access to a word hoard. And that word hoard contained all kinds of treasures, right? So a hoard, like a dragon's hoard, it's a treasury. And in that treasury are lots of beautiful images and phrases and half lines of poetry, because Old English poetry is arranged according to half lines, um, which are linked together by alliteration. So those half lines would be in the treasury and you could then access them. They didn't belong. This wasn't an image that belonged to one poet. So it didn't have that sense of property that I was talking about that came 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 across um, that we came across in the copyright law, where you start to say that people have they have proprietary ownership over this text. Contrary to that, in in old English poetry, we have the sense that there is this communal access to a set of beautiful poetic phrases that you can mine for yourself and then you can do your own things with. So I've, I've given a few examples here of when poets specifically talk about accessing the word hoard. So the first, uh, the first example there, um, and I'll just read one old English quotation so you can hear it. Chimse ildesta on swaroda, werodes wiza, word hoard on leak. So the most senior, the ildesta, the oldest, answered him, the leader of the war band, he unlocked the word hoard. So word hoard on Leak, and you can see that, that is actually quite similar to um, modern English on Leak, un unlocked. He unlocked the word hoard. I won't read out the old English for the next two quotations, just the translations. Then wisdom unlocked the word hoard again, sang her own truths and spoke thus. Widsith spoke, unlocked his word hoard. So in all of these examples, the word hoard is being accessed. When someone wants to make a speech, to sing a song, they can access the word hoard, which doesn't belong to them. It's something that is that is shared. And interestingly, the very way that they talk about unlocking the word hoard is itself an example of the use of that word hoard. Because you can see that in each one of those poems, there are different poems written by different people, they express it in exactly the same way, word hoard on leak, word hoard on leak. And it's, and it's a complete half line, second half line in each case. And it's linked back with alliteration to words beginning to one or two words beginning with W in the first half of the line. And again, because Old English is based around alliteration, there were lots of alliterative phrases that would be shared across poems. But this idea of having complete half lines that are shared across poems is something that is not very imaginable today in modern poetry. The idea that there would be lots of um, lots of similar lines or identical lines across different poems. If a poet was doing that today, they would usually be directly calling attention to the fact that they were using another poem as a source that they were, they were deploying that other poem. That's not what's going on here. These poets are not saying I'm using another poem as a source. No one owns these phrases. No one owns these formulae, the metaphors. You can't trace this direct kind of line of, um, of descent, of origin to repetition. Rather, everyone has access to it. Oh, I'm hearing some slightly strange noises. So I don't know if, um, if anyone needs to mute themselves. I'm hearing some funny squeaks. Um, anyway, so the idea of, of poetry then was based around an idea that poets share stories, but they also share phrases, words, 
images, whole chunks of poetry. Now, when we move into the slightly later, oh, you still right? Sorry, my screen went blank. These are the kind of uh, technical issues that um, are hard to avoid these days. So when we move into the slightly later medieval period, we start to see a greater move towards ideas of privacy. Still quite fledgling at this time, but we see people living in slightly more private spaces, not so publicly as they as they did in the in the great halls of um, of old English times, which are more Lord of the Rings esque. So in the later medieval period, although we're quite a long time before copyright laws, we do see more of a sense of proprietorial invention and of being on your own physically more. And at that time, we also see an upsurge in anxiety about what is lost if someone does try to create on their own. So I'm going to give you an example from Chaucer. So Chaucer is one of the most famous of English poets, um, and he lived and wrote in the 14th century had an extremely interesting life, including being a diplomat, being a prisoner of war, living through the Peasant's Revolt of 1381, all kinds of, of very interesting things, and wrote a very wide range of poetry. Now, the poem that I'm going to talk a little bit about now, to talk specifically about this idea of creativity and where ideas come from, where does creative genius come from? In this particular poem, The House of Fame, it's about writer's block. You know, I was talking before about the writer's block that's depicted in Shakespeare in Love. The House of Fame, written in um, the 1380s, probably, the late 14th century, Chaucer is writing specifically about the experience of not being able to write a poem. So it's a poem about the difficulty of finding ideas. Very, so it's very metatextual, self-referential. He's talking about the fact that he doesn't know what to write a poem about. Where can he get his ideas from? And while he's, you know, thinking about this, all kinds of interesting things happen to him, including he gets seized by a giant eagle and the eagle takes him up into the Milky Way and they look down on the world. It's all very you know, surreal and filmic in all kinds of ways. And the eagle starts to tell him off and says, you know, it's no wonder you haven't got any ideas. And this is what he says to him. And I'll read the Middle English on the left, but there's a translation on your right and I'll, I'll gloss it for you. So the eagle says to him, but of thy very neighbours that dwell an almost at the doors, thou hearest neither that nor this. So your neighbours dwell at your doorway, but you don't hear anything they say. For when thy labour done all is and hast made all thy reckonings, your accounts, when you finished work, done your accounting for the day, Thou goest home to thy house, sorry, instead of rest and new things, thou goest home to thy house anon, and as dumb as any stone, thou sittest at another book, till fully dazzled is thy look. So instead of doing new things, you just go home and you sit dumbly reading your book till you look completely dazed and livest thus as a hermit, although thine abstinence is light. You, you live like an isolated hermit, although you don't abstain like hermits do. Um, so the idea of this is that the eagle is saying to him, you don't have any ideas because you spend too much time on your own. You're just going home and reading books. And, you know, myself as an academic and many of my students, we can all, you know, sympathise with this problem of spending too much time on our own reading books. Um, for many of us, I'm sure this is the case for many of you as well. That is our typical mode. And here the eagle is saying, well, when you do that, you're sealing yourself off from collaboration and therefore you're sealing yourself off from some of the modes of creativity and it's interesting that the way the eagle expresses this is he suggests that the Jeffrey figure in the poem is is losing a kind of physical contact with the world he's losing his sensual experience of the world he calls him dumb as any stone he says his look is dazzled he says that he he's not seeing things he's not um, speaking to other people and what he says you should do is talk to his neighbours, go to the doorway. They dwell in almost at thy door. And at this point, Chaucer did live in an apartment over the gate, one of the gates to the city of London. He lived in, a, in an area that was packed with people. And essentially here, his guide figure is saying to him, well, if you haven't got any ideas, collaborate with others, talk to other people, get their ideas. And what Chaucer ended up doing was he wrote the Canterbury Tales, 
the Canterbury Tales is an absolute mix of talking to your neighbours and reading books on your own in the room. He suggests you need both things because the, te the tales are almost all based on literary sources, that kind of collaboration, but they're also staged as as tales told by ordinary people. And it's a great innovation in English literature where he brings in all these ordinary people, not rich people, not important people, to tell their stories and imagines a world in which you can hear those stories and think about kind of horizontal as well as vertical ways of, of production. So ways of literary production that not only take the wisdom of the past, but also access the contemporary world of the present and access both written and oral culture. And if you think about the, the kind of time in which someone like Chaucer was writing, you know, I was talking before about the advent of print, which was 100 years after this moment when Chaucer's writing The House of Fame. Before print, manuscript culture very much encouraged collaborative work. If you look at manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales, for example, you know, some of them have some tales are included, some are not. Some tales that Chaucer left unfinished, later writers and scribes have written in endings for them. In the actual pilgrimage, in the Canterbury Tales itself, the pilgrims who are on a journey to Canterbury, they don't get to Canterbury. Other writers found that quite unsatisfactory. So there are some manuscripts in which people have written in a scene in which they get to Canterbury and you see what happens to them. And each manuscript is different. So you can still have some versions that might approach more exactly what Chaucer wrote, but then there are others with these later editions in which other people have tried to do different things to the text. Now, often they might, in, in a reader's opinion, that might make it worse, but different readers will see things differently. And that's something that I think manuscript culture did very much encourage because the text was not set in, set in stone. It was very much changeable in each handwritten version. And I think that you know modern publishing obviously works very, very differently. And once you have the, the printed text, it is much less changeable. But there's still the case that before a text actually gets onto the page, gets onto the printed page, a lot of different people have had a hand in it. So it is not just the words of the author. Almost all authors will show versions to friends, to relatives, to their trusted early readers who will make sometimes very significant suggestions. Often the very idea for a book will have been suggested to an author by an editor at a publishing house. The text, whether it's a novel or a poem or a work of criticism or history, will then go through rigorous reviewing processes where other people read the book, where copy editors make changes. Lots and lots of people do um, have a hand in making any kind of book. But I think we largely hide that today. You know, we, we don't we don't put multiple names on a book. We still we very much emphasize the idea of that individual author. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the areas of creativity today that, in fact, celebrate collaboration, the kind of collaboration that I was talking about as very normal in earlier periods, but that has been somewhat um, denigrated, I think, in the last couple of hundred years. In a sense, I think um, the internet has made quite dramatic changes and there are now some areas of, um, of creativity in which people quite openly celebrate this idea of collaboration and that's something that, that the internet has allowed. So moving on from things such as Beowulf and Chaucer, I'm now going to talk about some quite different fan fiction. Now, fan fiction may well be something that many of you know a lot more about than I do. Um, I know very little about fan fiction, um, though I have had some students in recent years who have sometimes um, told me about their experiences writing fan fiction and even read, read, read out things that they, that they wrote a few years earlier. And it's obviously a really kind of fascinating and huge world that I think you know some of us don't know much about and some people are really plunged into. So when I was searching for fan fiction, I found this image, um, which was, a, was, was used in an article about fan fiction. And I mean, some of these, I can see what's going on. Some of it, I have to say, is a bit bewildering to me, though. Between us, we will probably all be able to grasp what's, what's happening here. Um, I mean, when I think about fan fiction, I think what most people think about is the fact that people can go, so anyone can go into these fan fiction sites and they can 
they can write text so they can write a sequel a follow-up a follow-up bit of any text that they like they can make things happen that they wanted to happen in the book but when i was looking at this image so clearly one of the things that's referenced right at the front is harry potter and you can see there that harry and hermione have somehow there entered into the world of star wars and there they are with their lightsabers um so we can imagine someone writing that that fan fiction but then what i was thinking about was that so behind harry potter right in the back in the back right hand corner you can see the image of the eye of sauron again i'm sure lots of you are familiar with that and the lord of the rings so iconic image from the lord of the rings with the eye of sauron now what i thought was interesting about this was that this may not have been intended by this image in fact i'm sure it wasn't but what it made me think about was the extent to which harry potter is itself an un unacknowledged fan fiction of the lord of the rings i think you know, many people have noticed this it was particularly striking to me quite recently when my children were encountering the Lord of the Rings, having previously encountered Harry Potter. And they were increasingly astonished by the similarities because they knew that the Lord of the Rings had been written earlier. And they were saying, but hang on. So in this text, written quite a long time before Harry Potter, you've got a dark Lord who people thought had died, but actually he hasn't died. Part of him still survives but he hasn't got a body anymore, but he can put part of himself into objects. There are a lot of similarities. And the more they read, the more kind of astonished they were by how much Rowling had taken from Lord of the Rings. And I'm sure you know, she would completely acknowledge that. You know, that is not plagiarism. You know, th this, is, this is how writing works. You, know, you take aspects, you take iconic ideas from other, from other texts. And that's very different from copying bits verbatim or, or anything like that. And some of the, these ideas are so kind of primal, they go across lots and lots of different texts. There isn't a direct one person invented it, someone else took it on. Um, but I was thinking about the fact that most people would think of Harry Potter as an origin text that people then write fan fiction about. But in fact, of course, it is part of a much wider web where it has taken inspiration from all kinds of places. I mean, in fact, Rowling was strongly influenced by Chaucer, for instance, and the idea of the Deathly Hallows comes from the Pardon's Tale, one of the Canterbury Tales. She was also, of course, influenced by things such as the School Story series, which were popular a, pre a generation earlier, and things such as the Lord of the Rings. So to an extent, we can see, um, we can see all literature as fan fiction in a way, though, of course, in of, of course, it varies a lot. So when I was thinking about this issue of, of fan fiction, something where anyone can kind of contribute and collaborate to create and develop these these worlds, I was looking up various definitions of fan fiction. And I found this one in something called the Urban Dictionary. And the person who's written this definition says, I noticed most of the other definitions here completely trash fan fiction. First definition, fan fiction, when someone takes either the story or characters or both of a certain piece of work and writes their own, creates their own story based on it. Sometimes you will take characters from one movie and put them in another. Um, I just skip over the next paragraph. And then the last one, it's true, however, that some fan fictions are rather poorly written and only a few hundred words. And it's also true that some people just write them so they can have their favorite characters have sex. But if you take the time to find something decent, you can end up with a fan fiction story that's so close to the original piece of art that you'd barely notice the difference. I mean, never really having read much fan fiction myself, I did find this quite funny, the idea that people are just writing them so they can have their favourite characters having sex. And then I was reading, I, haven't, I still haven't read any of these, but then I was reading about people who've written versions on the internet in which Draco and Harry end up married to each other. And you know, my mind was being boggled by, by this. Um, but what I, what I thought was particularly interesting about this definition was that it is from the Urban Dictionary. Now the Urban Dictionary is something where lots of people can put in their own definitions. It's crowdsourced. So it's like Wikipedia, where anyone can put in their own definitions and collaborate. Now I spend a huge amount of my time saying to students, don't use Wikipedia. <laughs> It's not reliable, which is true. It's not reliable. Don't use Wikipedia. But it is an interesting example of a place on the internet where collaboration is valued. 
Wikipedia, the Urban Dictionary, where this idea that lots of people can come can come up and put in their own material. And rather than having to rely on a kind of top down approach where someone authoritative tells you a definition, people can write their own definitions in something like the Urban Dictionary. And I do think that's quite interesting for thinking about the ways in which the Internet fosters a collaboration that at times can be more democratic. So thinking about the idea of fan fiction, I mean, to an extent, we could say that a text such as Virgil's Aeneid is a kind of fan fiction of Homer. It's taking characters from Homer's texts and writing a sequel for them. All texts are born from others. That's not, of course, to say that I think that there, they are all the all texts are the same. That there is no quality about texts about different texts. I mean, I think the fact that a text is derived from somewhere else doesn't tell us anything about its quality. So, you know, I think that Virgil's poem is better than um, fan fiction about Draco and Harry. But the mark of it as being better, it's not that it's not derivative. That's not what matters. It's not about being original or isolated or coming up with your own ideas. It's about how you express those ideas, how you use language, how you craft your writing, whether it's poetry or, or prose. That's what is, is a marker of, of the text, not the fact that it's done on your own. Now, people work, oh, sorry, I just skipped over one. People do work in very different ways. There are different ways of working with others. And I just wanted briefly to talk about one theory, which is that creativity comes about mainly through pairs. So someone wrote a book called The Power of Two, in which they talked about the fact that many great creations have come about through pairs of people. So you can see here, you might recognise some of these people. Um, I imagine the one on the left is the most recognisable. So Lennon and McCartney, um, the Beatles. Lennon said they wrote eyeball to eyeball. McCartney that they wrote light mirrors. They needed each other to spark off each other. On the right, you can see Percy and Mary Shelley. So two great authors, Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, Percy, the great poet. Again, something such as Frankenstein was born out of a, a creative group, uh, that, that pair and their friends who surrounded them. And at the bottom, scientists Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, um, their daughter said that their parents' work was fused and that it's almost impossible from their notebooks to distinguish who was doing what, because the handwriting by each covers the page is interspersed with each other. They thought of themselves for much of their work as a pair. You couldn't say where well, one person's work started and another ended. They worked collaboratively. I'm going to just um, conclude now for a minute or so. I want to reaffirm that I do think that the individual matters. I don't think that you could put together a group and then stick anyone in that group. And because of the nature of the group, they will come up with the same thing as Shakespeare would have in that group. Of course, I don't. I think there is individual intelligence and creativity. Um, I think that that creativity, though, can't exist on its own, that, that that individual brilliance needs others for the true creative spark. And I think that's become, I think, ever more clear to most of us in this really difficult era of social distancing, studying in isolation, as I'm sure you've all been having to do, giving talks on Zoom, you know, watching my own children learning while separated from their friends. I've never been more aware of the importance of creative collaboration or of the truth of my final quotation from John Donne, a very famous quotation that bears much repetition. No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or, or of thy own were, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee.